Okay. Okay. So we saw that um, the the exciting restorative work that the Holy Spirit does in you know the hardest of environments, right? In the most difficult of um, places, and we see that the Holy Spirit does the work. So so we can never ever you know kind of write off a group of people, or write off a church, um, and say. You know, this is always going to be stuck. They're go always going to be like this. Like it just needs, uh, God just needs one person right there. You know, there could be people who are praying in the background, just like, you know, uh, how it happened for me. Um, and uh, it could be, you know, just young folks who just, you know, passionate about the Lord. And the Lord would respond. And oh, sometimes he would even do a sovereign work. Okay, So throughout history, we see, um, you know, wherever... People call on the name of the Lord. That Lord does the restorative work. Okay, so um, there's one um, uh, there's one book. If I mean, you can if you're interested, you can read that. It's it's I think it's by a man named Tony Bennett. Uh, Bennett is definitely this name. I forget the first name, um, but it's, I think it's uh, it's called Six O'clock in the Morning. The title, and it's about a very very uh, you know very. Uh, what do you, what do you call, I forget the denomination, but it's a very, very conservative, uh, you can say, orthodox kind of a church. Okay? Not in India, elsewhere. But they were so far removed uh, from, from the truth. In the sense, you know, they would gather for Bible study, for example. Um, and so they, they would be smoking. Okay, so they gathered for Bible study. They'll all be smoking, including the pastor. And then they'll all put out the cigarettes and then say, okay, now uh, let's study the Bible. You know? So they, they're sincere. They didn't know um, the truth. Uh, so in that kind of a church, okay, you read about how the Holy Spirit moved, okay? how brought about change, how people got saved, how people got filled with the Spirit, how people you know experienced the the power of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, everything, and it's it's really an exciting you know uh, account to read. So so much so that, that the charismatic church of those times, they were so curious. You know, they were like, okay, wow, what is happening in this? And they began to invite this pastor, and this pastor was actually the last person to really encounter you know the work of the Spirit, uh, but others were praying. Or touch him, fill him, and all that. So, so the charismatic church of those times, you know, they they saw that God was doing something here. They recognized it, and they you know began to invite this pastor to come and speak to them and pray for them and all that. So, it's a it's a great book, right? You can um, I'll just get the exact title um, and share it with you. Okay. So anyway, so uh, the rest of the move of God, praise God for that. Right. So from where the church was, uh, from the depths of it, God has been restoring it, and and we are the recipients. You know, we are, uh, you know, we are living in such an exciting time, where we see these all these, you know, the truths being restored, and even more. Right. So for for us, we can just be grateful and walk in the fullness of it. Right? Embrace these truths and walk in the fullness of it. Okay. So. Um, Okay, next, we'll, we'll move on to the next uh, chapter, which is chapter 7. And uh, we're going to look at uh, the work of the Holy Spirit towards a sinner. Okay, Someone who does not know the Lord, someone who is, has not received Christ. Okay, So we see that the work of the Holy Spirit is required for that person to be drawn to the presence of God. Okay, So you and I... We were drawn to Christ because of the work of the Spirit. If not for the work of the Holy Spirit, we would not have come to the saving knowledge of Christ. We would not have been drawn to the truth. Okay, so let's look at uh, uh, you know some scriptures here. Okay. John chapter sixteen, verse eight, eight to eleven. Okay, maybe we can read from seven onwards. John chapter sixteen, verse seven. Okay, these are the words of the Lord Jesus, right? So he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I do not, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Verse 8. And when he is come, he will convict 
the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me of righteousness because i go to my father and see you no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged okay and verse 13 however when he the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak of his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and he will tell you things to come and so on so this is something that he does okay he says he will convict the world of sin so conviction it's not man's ingenuity or cleverness or skillfulness or even you know you know, oratory skills. Sometimes we think, no, okay, um, the more gifted the person is in terms of speech and in terms of, you know, maybe personality and all that, then people will be saved, people will be drawn. That's not the truth. You know, it we can probably, you know, people might, we can get people's attention through all this, right? But the actual conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus put it very clearly. He said, He will convict the world of sin. So, what does convict mean? Have you ever been convicted? And what does convict mean? He's going to convict the world. Yeah, sorry. So when you say, you know, I'm convicted. You're convinced. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically it means strong belief. Okay. Strong belief. You, you believe it. And you arrive at that place of strong belief because of various things that would have happened. You know, I'm, I'm convinced. And it could have been because of experience. It could have been because of your own learning. You know, all that. So the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit brings that conviction in the heart of the person. Okay. So maybe that person has been listening, hearing the gospel. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction in the heart of the person. And of course, you know, it means that the person is also responding, like cooperating, you know, saying, okay, willing. That you know, he'll he'll never do it or force it. Right? He, will not, he will not brainwash a person. Right? It will not do that uh, because he's given free will, free choice. So, um, okay, I, I can just. People can never see themselves as sinners apart from the convincing work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, very true, and nicely put. Thank you. Yeah. So the the strong belief that what I'm doing, what am I doing? You know, it's like it's like your eyes are open. What am I doing? Why was I doing that? That conviction is brought about by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so um, he will convict. He will convict the world of sin. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 2, 37 is an example where Peter shares the message. You know, it's a fairly long message, um, right after being filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Acts chapter 2. And um, it says here. In verse 37, now when they heard this, okay, so when they heard the message, what happens? They were cut to the heart. Is there any other translation, like any other way in which it's pierced their heart? Okay, it was piercing their heart. Um, so Acts chapter 2, verse 37, right? So they were pierced to the heart, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Okay, they had arrived at that place. They were so uh, you know, convinced, convicted that we need to do something now. Okay, we, have, we have been living a certain way. There needs to be change. What do I need to do? They were so convicted. Okay, so, so this is what they ask. Uh, you know, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then, of course, Peter tells them, repent and let every one of you be baptized. Um, and uh, you shall receive um, remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so conviction. So, so this means that we are we need to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. You know, maybe as ministers, 
Okay, as people who are maybe you've been praying for someone, you've been um, you know, uh, or you, you're ministering somewhere, you're sharing the message somewhere. We need to be reliant, totally dependent on the Holy Spirit, and say, and pray, and say, ask the Holy Spirit to convict. He will. Right? This is what He does. He will convict. That person and say, you know, and, and and we can just pray and ask, Lord, you give me the words to speak, God, so that these words, you know, will go forth with power and truth and clarity and uh, and and really cut to people's hearts. Right. So what is it that I need to speak? What is it that I need to share? So um, so that's something that, uh, you know, we need to do because this is the work of the Holy Spirit. So this also takes a lot of pressure off of us. Right? Sometimes we think, no, I need to do something. I need to get something done. No, that pressure is always there. I need to perform. I need to get something done. Or maybe you're leading worship and you're like, oh God, you know, I need to get something done. Yeah, true. In the natural, you, you know, you you prepare, you pray, uh, and you hear from God, and uh, you know, you move in faith and confidently, and and all that. That is your part. You know, preparation of the heart belongs to man. Right, so it is it is our part, but we are not really making things happen. You know, he is the one who does that. So that takes a lot of pressure off. You know, I used to really uh, be terrified of leading worship. You know, uh, in that youth group after I got saved, and because I could play the guitar, they'd say, you know, why don't you do? Why don't you lead? Every time it was my turn, I'll say, pass. You know, please, I. I'll find out some excuse, you know. I'll say no. I need to go. I, I'll just, you know, I was terrified. Why? Because I was so, you know, so conscious of people, so conscious of oh, I need to get something done. I need to present something well, and how can I do it? A lot of pressure on myself. But that whole thing disappeared after many years, actually, when um, when I was at a Ron Kennelly concert here in Bangalore, and Ron Kennelly, you know, he just came. It was actually a whole concert was washed out okay he sang one song it rained concert canceled we all went back home it was poured out uh, you know that day but this is one thing that he said you know, when he came on he said you know he said it doesn't matter if you guys are here or not okay this is how he started you know ron kennelly right how many of you know ron kennelly you've heard the song blessing and honor glory and power ancient of days okay, blessing and honor glory and power you know he's the one who who sang it and many, many old school songs, right? So anyway, so he said one thing. He said, it doesn't matter if you guys are here or not. You know, I'm here for the audience of one. Okay. So he's saying, you know, my worship is towards him. Okay. I'm here for the audience of one. So if you are here, that's fine. You know, that's okay. But really, my focus is on him. I'm here for the audience of one. And that was so liberating for me. I said, yeah, yeah, actually, that's the thing. Right? I'm actually worshipping God. It's not like I'm trying to do something to the people. Of course, we are facilitating, etc. But then the primary focus is God. So that took a weight off. Right? So I'm just sharing that to say that it is the Holy Spirit. It is He who brings conviction. Okay, He will do that. He will do His work. So we don't have to do the work of the Holy Spirit. Of course, we need to be clear. We need to present it well. We need to make sure that you know there are no barriers, you know, in in our own language, in the way we speak, that we don't hinder uh, the understanding uh, of how we, we need to do all that in the natural. But the Holy Spirit brings conviction, and when He brings conviction, there is change of heart. There is change of heart. It depends on the person who responds, but there is change of heart. Right? Just look at Paul. He's writing, he's been persecuting the Christians, he's on the way to Damascus to persecute some more. He has the encounter, falls off the horse or whatever animal he was riding, and he says, you know, who are you? Lord. He recognizes, you know, something happens and he hears when he has an encounter, who are you, Lord? Oh, he realizes there's something bigger, you know, here, you know, someone who's bigger, you know, overwhelmed by it. And that's it. That is all that we hear. He goes, he receives his sight, and Ananias goes and prays, and you know, amazing things happen, right? Um, so the Holy Spirit does that. Okay. Secondly, the Holy Spirit also, we see in that same verse, John 16 um, and verse 8, right? 
Okay, let's uh, let's read that again. Um, okay, I'm just going back to that verse. Okay, John chapter 16, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Okay, he will convict the world of righteousness. That means that righteousness that God has, the righteousness that that Christ brings. He will convict the world of that, the righteousness of Christ. Okay, we can always we can also say that he brings the assurance of righteousness to the one who believes as well. Okay, uh, that's not what the verse verse says, but I'm just saying that he brings the assurance of righteousness to a believer as well. Now we're going to look at that, but the fact is that he convicts the world of the righteousness of Christ. Okay, that he is the holy one, that he is the righteous one. Even that knowledge and conviction the Holy Spirit brings. Okay, so again, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, when people, you know, people have considered Christ and they knew that he was righteous. They knew when they study the life of Christ and you know other deities, and and they and they just say, Okay, wow, here's a, here's someone who's holy, here's someone who's pure, here's someone who did not dabble in something that was dark or sin. Here's someone who is infinitely holy. Right? He will bring that conviction. And the Holy Spirit also convicts the world of judgment, okay? Um, consequence of our action. You know, I'm sure you've heard testimonies of people saying, you know, I suddenly realized all the things that I had done wrong. Right? You've heard testimonies, you know, everything. It's as if the whole life, right from start to, to that point, they were just went before their eyes, and they knew that they were sinners, and they knew that this sin need to be judged. They were, you know, they were heading for punishment. Right? And who brings that? You know, these people could have been living uh, a very horrible life, a very unrighteous life. But who brings that conviction? The Holy Spirit. He brings that conviction of the judgment. The, he, so he convicts the world of judgment. Okay. Um, we see that the Holy Spirit also testifies of Jesus. Um, we, we saw that in the, uh, in the teachings of the Lord Jesus about the Holy Spirit, that he testifies, meaning he points, he gives evidence, and he confirms Jesus is who he says he is. Okay. So we're preaching about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is, again, he's preaching to the people. Right? So that's a beautiful thing. You know, when we are talking, when we are, the Holy Spirit is having a parallel conversation. Maybe he uses your words. Maybe he's just using you know something else. But he speaks and he convicts. Um, uh, uh, he testifies of Jesus. You know, let's look at um, the previous chapter, 15 and verse 26. John 15 and verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Okay, the Holy Spirit will testify about Jesus. Yeah, Jesus being who he is, Jesus being all that he said he is, the way, the truth, the life, the savior, the healer, the deliverer, the bondage breaker, everything. And, and the beautiful thing is this, you know, sometimes you preach a message on, you know, something. Maybe you're talking about financial management or whatever, and it's a message to the church, right, about stewarding money. The Holy Spirit will testify about Jesus to the person in ways that you did not think possible. So the person will say, you know, that was a wonderful message. In fact, we had a testimony like that. Right? It was something to do with finances. And I remember that Sunday, but that Sunday, uh, another, a person actually came to the saving knowledge of Christ, which you wouldn't think, you know, possible. You know, the message was not about salvation. It was not about sin. It was not about the need of a savior. But at the end of it, he was convicted and he said, I need Jesus. Okay. Why? The Holy Spirit testifies in way we, ways we don't even think possible, right? Um, okay, just a bit. Okay, right. So he testifies. Okay, let's look at one more scripture. Uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. Okay, Acts 5, 32. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So he's um, saying that, um, uh, that we are witnesses, we have seen it, 
and the holy and also is the holy spirit who has witnessed these things whom god has given to those who um, those uh, those who obey him right so the holy spirit testifies about jesus um and um uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3 talks about how no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit will can use anything to bring proof or convict or testify. Okay, But the main thing that the Holy Spirit uses is the Word of God, which is the truth. right? So he highlights the truth. He focuses. He, it's like him shining a light on that on that word that someone preached or shared, and he testifies. He says, "This is right. This is correct. Right? Or this is who Jesus is." Okay. So the Holy Spirit does that. Okay. Any questions here? Any questions? So we see that we are. Any questions? Yeah, Shira. No. So we see that we are dependent on the Holy Spirit. You know, as ministers of God, we are dependent. You know, uh, as as believers, we are dependent. Uh, so we're going to see, you know, the work of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Okay, I'm a believer. I've come to the saving knowledge of Christ. So what does the Holy Spirit do? You know, how does He work things in my life? Okay. So at the new birth, firstly, so we're looking at chapter eight. If you're following in the notes, right? So. We see that we are born again. Okay, how is a person born again? Anyone? Okay, so how does one how does that happen? Sorry? Through water baptism. No, water baptism is a proclamation of you being born again, of you becoming a child of God. But how does one become born again? Like if somebody says, I want to be born again, can you just teach me, show me? What would you tell? Mm. Okay. Yeah. So so I, I come and ask you, okay, Prince, you know, I, I want to be born again. So you just tell me. Okay, Shira. Okay. Huh? Okay. So you can. Okay. It, it's it's really uh, uh, the simple truth is to believe in Jesus and what He has done, right? So look at. Um, okay. Let's say. Okay. I, I see some comments here. Um, baptism by the Holy Spirit. Okay. When we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, um, well, first of all, you know the, the question is um, how to be born again, right? By receiving Jesus as Lord, yes. As many as received Him, so He gave them authority. Okay, by accepting Jesus, when we receive Jesus Christ and crucifying the old inner man. Water and spirit. Okay, so if you know, if you need to point to a scripture, what would it be? You know, uh, let's go to Romans ten. Okay, Romans chapter ten and verse nine. Okay, so Romans chapter ten and verse nine says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so that word used there, sozo, meaning salvation. Um, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. In verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is you know, a simple this thing, right? Simple, simple way in which we can. So we can start with that. Okay, this is what it is. If you need to be saved. You, you believe in Jesus, believe what he did for you on the cross, you believe that he died, that he rose again, and you confess with your mouth, meaning you accept, acknowledge, and uh, you receive, and right? receive this gift of salvation. Um, so so as, as simple as that. But who does that? The work of regeneration. 
it is the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now I have a part to play in the sense I believe and I receive as a human being. Okay, I believe that Jesus did this. I believe, okay, I acknowledge and I yeah, I repent. Yes, in all that, you know, I repent and say, okay, God, um, I need you. I, I want to leave uh, my old ways. But it's actually, you know, the main thing is that you believe what Jesus did for you on the cross, right? And you receive salvation. Now, the Holy Spirit, he does the work of regeneration. He does something in me, in us. Um, and that is what scripture says. He does the work of regeneration. Let's look at um, uh, John chapter 3. Okay, John chapter 3. This is the con conversation that uh, the Lord Jesus has with Nicodemus. Right? John chapter 3. Um, Okay, John 3, verse 1 to 8. Okay, there was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he's talking about being born again. To, to enter into the kingdom, to see the kingdom, right? Uh, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he's talking about natural birth. He's talking about physical birth. So he's saying, how can a man be born? He's already an adult. He's born, you know, uh, and how can he have a second birth like that? So Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone born of the spirit. Okay, So he's revealing a very foundational, fundamental truth um, but yet it is so very deep and significant, right? This is some, this is what happens. He says, unless you are born again, you cannot be part of the kingdom. You cannot see the kingdom. Right? And then how can I be born again? So then the Lord talks about physical birth and spiritual birth. He's saying that which is born of water is, that is, that, sorry, that, that you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit. Okay, so, and then he's, he goes on to contrast okay, what is born of water, saying that which is born of the flesh. And, and then he talks about unless one is born of the spirit, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And therefore, uh, one is born again. Okay, I just see a question here. Many people say it without really meaning it, if they have to mean uh, what Jesus did for them on the cross. Yeah, sure. That danger is always there. Anything can become, you know, a form without, uh, you know, a ritual without meaning. Um, but this is this is how, you know, a person is born again because that's what we um, see in scripture. Yeah, I, I, yeah, Krishna, I, I see your um, yeah point, right? Okay, so this is what the Lord says. You know, that which is born of the Spirit, which means that the birth that is happening to our spirit something some change that is happening to our spirit because of the work of the holy spirit okay so what does this born of the water mean it it again it refers to physical birth because he's contrasting between physical birth and spiritual birth right um, unless one is born of water and the spirit one cannot enter the kingdom of god uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh that which is born of the spirit is spirit well now the thing is um, Water does, it's, an, it's a natural element, it does represent, you know, it could na natural earth, but it could also refer to the word of God. Okay, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, it could also refer to the word of God. So it's not really clear, right? Um, but the thing is, he's talking about the difference between what is born of the flesh, what is born of the spirit. So, so we could say he's talking about natural birth and uh, spiritual birth. Okay, that spiritual birth, most impo important to understand is the spiritual birth is brought about by the Holy Spirit. 
It cannot be by man. And that is why we say it's a work of grace. It's a supernatural work. Right? So does that mean that man does not have any part to play? What do you think? You say that you know, can be born again only because of God, right? Can we say that? What do you think? Yeah. So salvation is by grace. So what does grace mean? Grace is something that you did not deserve. Okay. It's grace. It's given. It's free. You cannot earn it. So that's grace. But also we see that it is by faith or through faith, by grace, through faith. So faith involves my acceptance and my, you know, my receiving it, my understanding of it, my receiving it and saying, yeah, I need this. It involves my choice, right? Yeah, you have a... Sorry, sorry, uh, tell me again. Right. So, uh, so what you're saying is that uh, is that works is what you what you what is your question? Uh, okay, whether it involves anything from your side. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but that analogy, no, that um, that would apply to the early disciples in the sense, uh, you know, Jesus had to be born. Jesus had to be raised up. He uh, uh, he had to be resurrected, and for the salvation to be complete, right? He had to be born. He had to die. He had to be raised up, and uh, he ascended. And then you know he was filled with the Spirit and so on. Um, yeah, in that sense, yes. But then for uh, the New Testament church, for the New Testament believer, well, it's not like uh, I hear about Jesus, then I uh, you know I live a good life for some time. And then come to the saving knowledge of Christ. You know, it's not like that because uh, we also read about those times when, like in the house of Cornelius, right? In the house of Cornelius, people are listening, hearing the word for the first time, right? Peter go, goes there, he preaches. They're hearing uh, the gospel for the first time, and they hear, they believe, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. Acts chapter ten, you know, we read about that. Samaria, same thing, Acts chapter 8, when we read, they hear the gospel, they are, so it's not like they heard, they walked for some time, they tried out, lived the principles, and then they, so, well, you know, the thing is, uh, man can actually uh, be examining the truth for some time, you know, like we need, read about some people, you know, especially from the Islamic faith, um, well, they, they are this, so resistant to receive Christ, and they are examining, they are studying to see whether it's true. But they are not born again. They have not come to the saving knowledge. But they are, you know, they are seeking. They want to know whether it's true. So that is possible. Um, but being born again is like the minute you believe and you receive, uh, you are born again. And that's and that work is the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, like you said, yes, man has a responsibility of believing. Man uh, has a responsibility of extending his faith and receiving. Okay, here's a question: Is it necessary to be baptized in water um, when one is baptized by the fire of the Holy Spirit? Is it necessary to be water baptized uh, when one is baptized by the Holy Spirit? Okay, so the thing is, uh, okay, this is a question from Krishna. Um, well, two different things, Krishna, and then. We see that um, both are, you know, we, we see both are in scripture and both are laid down, especially when it comes to water baptism. We see that in the Great Commission, the Lord Jesus talks about that. He says, you know, uh, and uh, he, he lays that out to the, uh, you know, instruction to the uh, disciples. And the disciples also faithfully carry it out, right? They, they preach the gospel, uh, they, 
baptize people in water uh, and you know pray for baptism of the holy spirit we see that right through scripture uh, and especially you know as we were just uh, talking about the baptism um, in cornelius or, or the peter's ministry in cornelius house acts chapter 10 what happens is that people are actually filled with the holy spirit already right he prays he preaches the gospel people receive christ people are filled with the holy spirit and then peter says you know uh, why, why, why can't I, I'll just read out his exact words? So, so the answer is yes. Um, you know, two different things. Um, in obedience to Christ, uh, one can you know go ahead and do that. Right. So, if you look at Acts chapter ten, uh, let me just quickly read out that verse. Acts chapter ten, verse forty-four onwards, and the verse that we want to look is uh, look at is forty-seven. Okay, verse forty-seven. Can anyone forbid water? that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So that is Peter's question. Right? And then he goes on and he says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they asked him to stay for a few days. So what has happened before that is that they'd heard the gospel. They are, the, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the proof of that, in a sense, for these Jewish people, uh, the proof that they had received the gift of the uh, Holy Spirit is, in verse 46 for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify god so um yes it is it is fine it's absolutely fine um to be baptized even if a person is um, baptized in the holy spirit you know i shouldn't say absolutely fine it's actually an obedience to the instruction of christ right okay another question from karen um pastor is it mandatory to be baptized to take part in the communion Okay, uh, not really. Baptize, I, I, I guess you're talking about water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, you know, whatever it is, you know. Um, so, sacra you know, there are two sacraments for the New Testament church. I'll make this quick. Um, one is we see the Lord's table, which is communion, and we, what we see as um, uh, water baptism. So these are the two physical acts which are symbolic of deeper spiritual significance, right? So th those, these two we see. Now, is it important or is it necessary to be baptized in water, uh, baptized in water, in order to take part in the communion? We don't see that qualification in Scripture. Okay, uh, all that we see is that one the, the the qualification that is required is that one needs to be a follower of Christ. One needs to have one needs to be born again, right? Because I think we need to look at what does it mean to take communion what does it mean to be baptized in water right so that's the question what does it signify to a believer communion it signifies the death the the death of the lord jesus on the cross the sacrifice on the cross and what it means to me as a as a believer you know the great transaction that happened the exchange that happened and all that i have because of his death on the cross and the lord jesus said you know do this in remembrance of me and we proclaim his death and we proclaim the outworking of it the finished work of it every time we do that so that is what it means baptism again we proclaim the death burial resurrection and the fact that we identify with that right when he died, we died. When he rose again, we also uh, were brought to life. And we are spiritually seated with him in the heavenly places. Right? We belong to Christ. So we are proclaiming that. We proclaim and we do that you know, uh, as, as a obedience to the instruction of Christ. Right? So we see that. OK, so uh, any, we don't see any other qualifier okay, um, in scripture to say that one needs to be necessarily water baptized in order to take communion. Now, having said that, I know that you know certain places they uh, have that instruction. You know, the pastors will say, you know, if you're a believer, if you're water baptized, and only then take communion. Well, now that comes from a place of, I believe, it would have started when they when they, when they sincerely want the best for the believer. In the sense, they want to make sure that. It is not a haphazard thing, you know. It's not uh, they don't want the believer to live or uh, a compromising life and and all that. They just want to make sure that they're serious about it, right? So probably that it would have started that way, but actually in scripture, you don't see that, right? 
Okay. Okay, one more. Uh, family comes from a different faith. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. Would I need to change my surname if I do so? No, 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 you don't have to. Right? Um, so, uh, water baptism, like if you're here in Bangalore, you know, there'll be opportunities every alternate month. Um, you could, uh, you know, you could be baptized, but if you are uh, elsewhere in the country, maybe you can check. Um, you know, with the nearest church which believes in water baptism, that if they would do that, uh, you know, uh, and it you can just get that you know settled in your heart that you obeyed the instruction, you just declared that you belong to Christ. And uh, with regard to changing the name, you do not have to, right? You don't have to do that. Um, right? Like I think your question is because some some people give up, uh, you know, a new name. Right, uh, when they are water baptized, maybe their name was Krishna, for example, and then the pastor says, Okay, now Krishna, your new name is Christopher. <laughs> okay, uh, on the day of water baptism, I mean, that's fine, but you don't have to officially, you know, kind of change it, etc. Uh, that's I hope that helps, Krishna. Yeah, okay, right. So, where were we at the new birth? Right? So the Holy Spirit brings about the new birth. He brings about the work uh, of regeneration. Okay, let's look at a few scriptures. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Okay, let's. Okay, um, 1 Peter 1 verse 23. Um, since you have purified your souls, in obeying the truth through the Spirit, I'm reading verse 22, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Okay, so we're looking at that uh, whole aspect of the water, again, referring to the word, you know, we look uh, when we look at Ephesians five. It talks about we were washed by the water of the word, okay. washed meaning cleansed by the truth of God's word. Right. Um, so washing of the water of the word. So, well, when 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 the Lord Jesus said, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, the people have said, okay, it maybe it infers the, it refers to this also. You know, that uh, you're born again by the incorruptible word of God and by the work of the Spirit. Okay. Okay. Let's look at one more verse. Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. Okay. Titus 3, verse 4. Okay. Okay. Let me just read. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Titus 3, verses 4 and 5. Okay. Um, verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So this washing, this regeneration, this review, uh, renewing happened because of the Work of the Holy Spirit. So it's wonderful, right? The Holy Spirit did a deep spiritual work in me. Okay, so I'm sure that you've been learning that in identity in Christ, who we are in Christ, right? The fact that you became a believer, it's not like a, like a New Year resolution. Okay, you decided, and now you feel that okay, it's not going well. So you know I can change it. Um, something happened when you believed when you put your faith and trust in God, in the Lord Jesus. That when you were born again, something deep, something deeply, significantly spiritual happened. The Holy Spirit did a work of regeneration. The Holy Spirit did a work of renewing in you. That your spirit was regenerated. What does regenerated mean? It's, it's important that we understand that because this is what happened to us. Right? It's, it's happened to me. It's happened to you. So, what does it mean? Yeah. 
go back, to grow back, to regenerate, right? To bring back something which was probably, you know, which was uh, which was dead, right? So this, this is what it takes, uh, you know, it, it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate, you know, someone's spirit who's dead to Christ, right? To, for us to become alive, for our spirits to be born again, it takes the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's a supernatural work. It's a work that only God can do. And he has done that in each one of our lives. So which is why that we can relate to him. You know, we, we, we know that there is, there is new life. We know that there is a change. Nobody has to reason it out with you. You know, nobody has to give you like five arguments. Okay, point one, point two, point three. You know, this is why you're born again. You know inside something has changed. Right? No arguments, no reasoning, no proof. You know, you felt it. And that was the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's not because you made a decision and good decision, and suddenly you're feeling happy. There was a deep, there is a deep work of the Holy Spirit, which has been done in you. Okay, so a supernatural work that is done in you, and because of which you are, you and I are born again. Okay, okay. Um, Make it forming again, right? Okay, let's look at uh, uh, one more uh, verse. Um, so it talks about how the spirit of sonship has been sent into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Okay, now because of who we are become, you know, as born again as believers, now we relate to God as Abba Father. Okay, as His son, as His daughter, right? as sons and daughter, and and that's the most natural thing. And even that is because of who the Holy Spirit, uh, what the Holy Spirit did in our hearts. Right? Uh, let's look at um, uh, Galatians four six and seven. Galatians four, verse six. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, "Abba, Father." Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Okay. So he sent forth the Holy Spirit to our hearts, in our hearts to cry out, Abba, Father. Okay. Another verse, Romans 8 and verse 15. Okay. So Romans 8, verse 15. Sorry? Um, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit, verse 16, himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay, So the spirit of sonship, you know, we've received, and he gives that assurance of sonship. Okay. So we, we can actually pray, Lord, I just need to feel that again, God. Now that's that sonship I, that I'm your child. Now I just want to want that assurance, and the Holy Spirit will do that work. Right? Um, he's already indwelling us, and He gives that assurance, that confidence, that security that you are a child of God, which is a precious thing, which is a beautiful thing. Right? That He's your heavenly Father. That He is that perfect parent. That we may not have on the earth, okay, or we may have had parents who, who fall short, or maybe terrible parents, whatever it is. But the fact is that he is the perfect parent, and he gives us that assurance, that safety, that security, uh, which is something beautiful, right? So you see that Holy Spirit works in all these ways in a believer's life. We're going to look at some more uh, in the next class, in everyday life, in holiness, in sanctification. So we come to the end of it and say, hey, I cannot exist without the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So which means that I cannot resist the work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit does all this and more in my life. Right? Okay. Okay, we'll stop here. And uh, we'll meet next class. Thank you, online students. Thank you for your questions, for your participation. Uh, we'll catch up next time.
God bless. Bye-bye.